Honorable members of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, our guests from other cadres in attendance, our distinguished panelists and moderators, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Daniela Munene. I'm the CEO of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya, and I'm very pleased and privileged to host this session of Pharmacy COVID-19 Dialogues where we talk about what pharmacists are doing to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> we have held these dialogues for three months now, and we have learned so much where our members and even other pharmacists from other jurisdictions and even other cadres share with us about uh, the COVID-19 response. And so I'd like to introduce our moderators for today. Our first moderator is Dr. Michael Mungoma. He's a member of the Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. He's also the Dean School of Pharmacy at Mount Kenya University. <clears throat> He's also a member of the PSK National Executive Council, National Executive Committee of the National Governing Council, and he's a member of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Welcome to our webinar today, Dr. Mike Mungoma. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Our second moderator is Dr. Sylvia Opanga. She's a member of PSK. She's also a senior lecturer at the School of Pharmacy at the University of Nairobi. She's also the chair of the Education and Public Health Committee of the PSK COVID-19 Response Task Force. Karibu sana, Dr. Opanga. Thank you very much and welcome participants to the webinar. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Now I'll just hand over to you, Dr. Mungoma and Dr. Opanga to take us through the program. Thank you. Okay, good morning once again and welcome to the webinar. So before we start, we have a few ground rules and announcements. All participants are muted during the entire course of the webinar. Please ask questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of your window. Don't use the chat um, tab. Questions shall be addressed by panelists in the course of the program and not in the middle of it. For, uh, regarding CPD points, for PSK members, if you've not already done so, please subscribe on the PPD portal for today's webinar so that you can get your CPD points. Only current members shall be awarded CPD points. Uh, please go back. Um, the other cadres, we shall send the attendance list to your association or council for awarding of points. This webinar is being recorded and the audio will be made available on PSK's YouTube page. So on to the agenda of the day. Today, we have two speakers, Dr. Odiambo David and Dr. Esther Anyango. So Dr. Odiambo David will speak about the future of pharmacy and how young pharmacists are responding to COVID-19. We'll give him half an hour. And then Dr. Esther Anyango will talk about uh, the same, her experience. And then at midday, we'll go into the Q&A session. So I'd like to welcome Dr. David Odiambo to start with his presentation, before which I will introduce him. Uh, Dr. David Odiambo is a pharmacist, a pharmacist intern with a passion for commitment to improve access to quality healthcare services through his vocation. He supports CAPI as an administrative assistant coordinating the association's advocacy work, prior to which he worked with the Kenyan Healthcare Federation as a projects assistant. He was the president of the Pharmacy Students Association, um, KEFSA, in 2016 or 20, uh, to 2017, among other leadership positions he held while at, the, at J. Kwart University. He also runs a social enterprise called Right Culture Health and Social Innovation. He believes he has a responsibility to leave the world a better place than he found it 
and this usually guides his work. So welcome, um, Dr. Odiambo. I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Esther Anyango. Esther Anyango Adiambo is a recent graduate of the Bachelor of Pharmacy degree from the University of Nairobi, where she graduated last year. She's currently undertaking her compulsory internship year under the Ministry of Health. She's passionate about the pharmacy profession and the role that the pharmacist plays in healthcare, especially during a pandemic. She's involved in PSK's efforts in the COVID-19 response as part of the case management and infection prevention and control committee. Anyango also works as an intern at the FIP under the FIP WISE initiative and is involved in various clinical research activi um, activities at the International Pharmaceutical Federation. Welcome, uh, Dr. Esther. So I will quickly move to Dr. Odiambo's presentation. Please step over, Dr. David Odiambo. Thank you very much. David? I think David is muted. David? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Panga, and thank you all the participants we have in the room over 185. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So as I lighted, I'm a pharmacist intern currently doing my internship in my eighth month of internship started in December. And over the period that have we have had COVID, that's from March, the first year that was reported in the country. I've been involved in a number of initiatives, a number of projects that are looking at how we can respond to the current COVID situation. And that is the scope of what I'll be sharing today. And I hope we learn from it and we make the world a better place as pharmacists, because that is what we are as a profession, as a vocation in terms of a professionalism. The society depends on us to make the right move that's going to safeguard our interests and the interests of the entire society. So that would be the cover of what I'm doing. And on the introduction, I just have to mention, I'm also part of the PSK COVID-19 response team, the health, education and public health committee. So I'll also speak to that a little bit. So as you all remember, the first case that was reported in the country was on 13th of March. And the challenges that are presented all over, there's been disruption in our lives. For example, now we find people working from home in the normal practice in the hospitals and all, there has been a disruption, contact with patients, contact with colleagues. It's limited because of the fear of transmission of infection and all. Before we become professionals, there's the disruption in our training because we have to be trained, we have to get the requisite skills to be able to deliver quality healthcare services to the people who need it. And that has been affected. For example, universities closed, that is some of them have been installed and now there's transition to online learning. And on the same case, for example, under my internship, I am expected to learn under individuals and another other group of people within the hospital, hospital setting and even every other practice setting. That is part of training. There has been a disruption because the normal trend is not happening. Then looking at it because in a whole system, there are structures, guidelines and laws that influence how we respond and how we act. In the current case where we have COVID-19, some of the policies were aligned. They didn't have the measures in place to cater for the need for. The, for, for the disruption that would be caused with COVID. So there are changes that are happening in the space. So how do we go about it? For example, I am in the first group of pharmacist interns who are working under the new internship guidelines. And in that case, there was the public health component where we were supposed to do the public health outreach in the communities. There's no ease of it having you as a public, uh, public health, com community health pharmacist reaching out to families because of the fear of exposure to COVID-19 and even the risk you pose to them. So how do we go about all that kind of measures? So anchored on this, it's key that we all realize that there's work that needs to be done. And because there's work to be done, we know there was the customary trends that have been in the pharmacy practice. Most of it has been, for example, when I joined 
pharmacy school in 2013, what I knew about pharmacy is either you're opening a pharmacy or a chemist, that's the community pharmacy, you're either in the hospital setting or you're in the pharmaceutical industry. But in the, well, with the onset of COVID-19, all the issues that are affecting health systems, I realized that there's so much more that we can do as pharmacists. So we have to improve on what we've been doing. But at the same time, when we're improving on what we've been doing, there are new paths, there are new ventures where we have a role to play to ensure the ultimate quality healthcare outcomes that patients and our societies need is able to be realized. So that is the basis of what we have to look into. So the next slide, um, the scope of what we are looking at, part of the PSK COVID-19 response team, my internship experience, then as mentioned, I run a social enterprise that's agriculture, health and social innovation. There's a COVID-19 operational research task force that we established in mid of April, then non-communicable diseases, and then finally there's a community pharmacy survey that we are working on. So on the next slide, so as part of the Education and Public Health Committee under PSK COVID-19 response team, we realized that for every intervention that is being done, for every kind of work that we're doing as professionals in the line, our line of work, there has to be, to be an educative bit of it. And we're looking at how we have to prevent infections, and that is the communication bit. So as a member of the PSK COVID-19 Education and Public Health Committee, we look at what interventions are being done. For example, when we're having COVID-19 capacity building training so that we have better responses. That communication has to meet the needs of the pharmaceutical sector, the pharmaceutical professionals who are working. So as part of the COVID-19 team, we had the moment like we look at what interventions are being proposed. Does it cater for the extra services that pharmacists are offering? For example, when we're looking about pharmacovigilance, a number of drugs are going to be, are being used. Some are still being reviewed whether they have efficacy in COVID-19. But does these measures, these guidelines on use of this product have considerations on what pharmacists need to perform as extra services? Do we have pharmacovigilance measures to ensure their safety, any adverse drug events? For example, we could talk about the hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine that were being flaunted initially as drugs for COVID-19. They could have some beneficial effects. What were the measures being put in reporting any adverse drug events and the, the investigative measures that were put, put behind it? So when these are integrated in the whole care plan, then that is going to ensure the quality outcomes. And those are some of the discussions that we had in the COVID-19 team. And other than just having these discussions, members of the COVID-19 response team, the people who have experience, or experienced, the people who have been in the practice for a while, so I get to learn from them. And that kind of mentorship is enabling us to be better professionals when we get to the point that we now are practicing at the point I'm doing my internship, but I'm learning from them. And when I learn from them under such kind of not the best circumstances, it puts me at a better position to share the learning such that when we have the most ideal of situations, we make a difference, and that difference makes a whole ripple effect in making the health systems better. So in that, I've also been contributing and supporting different research proposals that are being done because we have to ensure there's evidence that's guiding any of the interventions that are being done. And at this point, I can say there are a number of proposals that are still being worked on by the members of the team. Dr. Panga and Dr. Mungoma are part of the team as well. So that is the response that the things that the initiatives that we've been have been part of in the COVID-19 response team. In the next part, we're looking at my internship experience. I started my internship at Kenyatta National Hospital. That was in December 9th and went through up to 11th of June. Then after that, I transitioned to my primary healthcare rotation, which I finished yesterday, and I'm due to start my industrial internship. So from March up to June, it part of the hospital rotation, you are expected to interact with patients, process their prescriptions and all that, which is a very important bit. But at the end of the day, with COVID-19 in the country, we are limiting exposure to patients because you don't know what they're suffering from. And as an individual, I also pose a risk to them. So in that kind of a situation, our clinical rotations were disrupted. You can't go to the wards as much because of the fear of exposure. And at that time, the issue of PPEs was coming in and how do we get the, get the right ones and how do we interact with the patients? So when that happened, the first response that we had, we were 11 pharmacist interns at Kenyatta National Hospital at that time. So we had an engagement and we had a number of meetings. We needed to learn. And for us to learn, we wouldn't use COVID-19 as an excuse of not going to learn. So in our 
plan one, we had to divide, de, like divide ourselves into groups, and these groups would reach out to specific clean wards and specific patient care points to identify cases that we could learn from, we could discuss within or among ourselves, and even on our WhatsApp groups, that's one. Beyond that, there are specific cases, as I've mentioned on the first, the second point of them. We have strange cases and very critical ones as well. For example, we have neglected tropical diseases, visceral leishmaniasis, calaza. It has been in the country, but at the end of the day, it's one of the neglected tropical diseases. So when doing my internship, we had cases that were being reported, referrals majorly from Kitui. And at this point, it's, it's a minor condition and it's, it has clear diagnosis and clear management. So nobody would suspect that someone with visceral leishmaniasis would be referred all the way from a remote community to Kenyatta for management. So if therefore the suspicion was limited, but we had to follow up and ensure they have access to medicine, that those are some of the things that we responded to in the challenge, with the challenges that we're having with COVID. Another thing I mentioned, acute kidney injury. There's acute kidney injury that was being reported as a complication of COVID. But in this case, it's peculiar because this was a kid who was 13 years old with no underlying comorbidities, no history of medical conditions. But this is something that within a week, that six days, there was acute kidney failure, and there was, it was even progressing to a point that the kid had to be dialyzed over that period. So those are some of the things that we had to learn and see how we were responding to. And beyond that now, at the outpatient pharmacy, I was involved in patient education, infection prevention and control measures, and promoting adherence to these measures. And in promoting adherence, the most critical bit of our communication at the pharmacy was, let these people know that any information that you're sharing with them, it's not because it's what the government is telling them. It is for their own safety. Because we realize everybody is self-centered, they look out for what is good for them at a personal level. So if you let them know it's for your well-being, it's to protect you from getting an infection because it might be the severe form and you risk losing your life or getting hospitalized, then they are willing to take it up. So with that, the adherence we try to make is as much, and that's also something that I carried on to the primary health center where we can get these patients on infection prevention measures and beyond that there was the limited contact with patients in this case in the primary health centers as you all know prescriptions are written on papers and these papers are normally given to the patients to take to the pharmacy with COVID-19 where we are at the facility now most of the contact was left so that prescriptions are written by the clinicians they are taken by one of the support staff within the hospital, they can go to the pharmacy after being recorded. So there's not much of contact between the healthcare workers and the patients, except for the consulting and the patient counseling at the pharmacy outlet. Then beyond that, in public health centers, our focus was ensuring the public health interventions are adhered to. So in this case, a matter of educating the public about discussing health issues, the health promotion, health preventive measures, but because of the sheds that were there initially, there were benches that were already in place, we couldn't use that place because one, the, the social distancing measures would not be adhered to, which is a critical issue that we have to consider. So we resorted to using the three sheds that were there, using the, like, there's a, the Tumaini clinic at the facility. So we use the plastic seats and using the sheds. We discuss issues that are affecting them. And some of the critical things that we have, we have got to understand is that especially on issues of HIV AIDS patients. Majorly for the teen support group, we discuss issues that are affecting them. They are human beings, they relate with the individuals in their societies, but at the end of the day, some of their personal interests are not catered for. We look at their medical conditions, we treat the disease, tell them to use the medicines, but how do they relate with people who don't understand it? The self-stigma bit, so that is another thing that we also looked at as well. But these are points that we are discussing them in the outset of COVID-19. There are so many things that are happening around them which affect them as individuals. So that is on an internship experience. On the second slide. So part of the COVID-19 Operational Research Task Force, Recalch is a social enterprise. We founded it in 2017 with a group of friends. And most of our work has been on health communication, health advocacy, capacity building, and mentorship. So when COVID-19 happened, as I mentioned, training was a disrupted education. And being we started the work, we realized most of our pharmacies colleagues who are still in school, the students who are there, didn't have a platform where we could learn together, share the information that's coming out, and how do we verify that at least there's some credibility in this information. 
So with the operational research task force, what we focused on was our health communication and infection prevention measures. So in that case, any communication that is being relayed, how is it ideal? For example, if you tell people to wash their hands, it's not feasible if they don't have the ability to get the resources that they need. So is it feasible? Is it something that can be implemented? And if it's not implementable, what are the other information that we need to share with the same information? So those are some of the analysis that we did. And we published a number of articles on the same on our website majorly. And some of them have also been relayed through the e-community engagement mechanism under the Ministry of Health because we're part of the team. In terms of clinical case management, what is the evidence behind use of different drugs? And for example, the impact on different communication strategy. If we had issues on alternative medicines, the herbal remedies, for example, the Madagascar cure, how does the public perceive it? If it's coming from a political person or an influential figure, then the uptake would be high. And what does that impact on the quality of care that individual success? So those are some of the things that we had to discuss and we give out a communication that even if it's a brief article, a brief paper that we're writing, it has a basis because it guides people to do what they feel is right rather than being influenced by individual preferences and the influencers who are in their society. Then the parallel operational services, for example, the communication coming from the government is that when you suspect you had COVID-19, you had called 719. After calling on 719, you are supposed to get an ambulance ferrying you from your point of, from your house to an isolation center or a quarantine facility for testing and all that. Do we have the parallel operational services to ensure this communication is being adhered to? If it wasn't, then there was a lapse in the system and this needed to be addressed. And we had to communicate that these are issues that are not being met and there's need to improve on them. Because if you're telling me that if I'm sick, I call 719, there's a response team that will come for me and it's not happening, then the next time I don't trust the system because even what's communicated is not being adhered to. Risk of in transmission of infections so high, and we increase the burden of COVID-19. Then we have the health and allied health programs. We have issues on maternal care, adolescent health services. We've been hearing about teen pregnancies. Move it, move to mental health issues, global health concerns. There are programs that had been in place and they have been in place, but with COVID-19, there has been a disruption in the system. How are these affected? And what measures do we have in place? And in that, there's a paper that we wrote with our team on the different communication strategies, adopting learning from the previous communication infections. Another thing was on mental health, the psychological impact, looking at it in the immediate context where there's so much disruption in our social systems, and beyond that in the healthcare space, how do we cope with it and how do we move to the next phase? And that is a paper that we had, and it has got a number of viewership as well, and I realized that some of the guidelines that were there has been integrated in the current response mechanism ensuring movement in the psychological support system for healthcare workers. Then in the pharmaceutical systems, supply chain issues that were there, there has been speculations in terms of shortage of supplies, if not so shortage, the quality of products that are coming into the country, the regulatory environment. So how do we ensure that the regulatory environment is ideal? Personally, I heard about regulatory affairs in 2018 during my schooling years. How many people know about it in the pharmaceutical, pharmacy team that we are with? Not much is there, but we realize that policies and regulatory frameworks guide how we operate in every place. In issues of clinical trials, when the French scientists mentioned having trials being done in Africa, the first thing was an uproar because we felt like as Africans, we're being used as guinea pigs. But we realized that clinical trials and all these kind of scientific research are ideal in ensuring the drugs are being used and they are effective in managing a particular group of people. So the issue is not whether they're being done or not, but it's how the information is being communicated. And even now, at that point, the COVID-19, different drugs were being used. Were they approved? No. But they are not approved for COVID-19, but they're being used. It means it's a clinical trial because this is the use of a particular drug in management of a condition for which it is not approved. So we have to communicate in a way that patients see the benefit of the science behind it. And when they see the benefit of the science, they adopt it and ensure we have credible evidence in terms of managing our conditions. So the main focus was enlightening the group, members of the group in terms of different facets of health communication, the healthcare systems and all the pharmaceutical parts and what role we can play. Rather than focusing on the clinical only, which is important, focusing on the industrial work, and all, 
we have to look at it in terms of the entire health system chain and what role we can play and getting to know what's happening in the current state when you're not in school, but at least you get exposed and see which areas you would be interested in venturing into. And so far we have over 15 articles that have been written with the team. And that is amazing progress because I know it's not something that would have happened if there wasn't COVID-19, but now we've done it. And the next phase that would be happening is we get to do much of that, we get exposed, and this gives a platform for, for all the other pharmacies, the senior pharmacists in the profession. We have a role, you need, have a role to mentor us and give us the guidance. And I'm glad that I've been members of the different teams with the Kinofanga, Mungoma, Daniela, and all these senior pharmacists who have been guiding me. If we can translate that into guiding the other young pharmacists, we would be at a far much better place and the profession would be on the right track. And that is where we need to start from. On the next slide. Next, that was operational research. Next, yes. So then another thing that we realized during the onset of COVID-19, there was an issue of patients with non-communicable disease, especially diabetes and hypertension, being at mass higher risk to developing severe complications and even dying. So in that case, we realized that there are people who have these conditions. How do we ensure they get the right information they need? And when they get the right information they need, they are better suited to respond to them and even pre prevent themselves from getting infections. So we formed a partnership with Maidawa and e-pharmacy. And in that partnership, we were to communicate with a number of different civil society organizations, the patient advocacy groups, educating them on the risk that COVID-19 posed to their patient groups. And other than that, what other measures do they have? Because we need to ensure compliance with medication is adhered to so that they comply, manage their vitals and everything that is needed, and they stay healthy over that period. So in that webinar, it was a five-part series. We registered 446 participants, and the ones who were logged in during the participation were 222 participants. And I think this kind of information, it makes a difference because these people are able, uh, able to cope and prevent risk of infection based on the information that we shared with them. And that is a starting point to realize that now, if we can engage these patient advocacy groups, it means any intervention that are being designed are specific and responsive to their needs. And that is a very critical component in terms of the healthcare service delivery for more discovery in this kind of work. The next one. Next, yeah. So this is the final slide on the kind of initiatives that we've been engaged in. At the onset of COVID-19 and over time, we've always known that the first point of contact most of the times has been through community pharmacies. When I'm feeling a headache, I'm having some stomach upset, the first place I'll go to is a community pharmacy. So if that's the case with COVID-19, more people are averse to seeking care from hospitals. And it therefore mean definitely they were going to the, com to the community pharmacies to get their care, to get their medicines, which is a good for them. But then, how do we ensure that the community pharmacies are responding to the care needs of these people? If you went to a hospital, you'll be sure you'll meet probably a hospital pharmacist or a clinical pharmacist who will do the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical care range, that is medication therapy, monitoring, medicines, reconciliation, the counseling services and all. What happens to the community pharmacies? And in community pharmacies, from the statistics that I read, we have over 25,000 with only 5,000 owned by pharmacies. So the over 20,000 are not owned by pharmacies. How do we make it be ideal so that all the community pharmacies improve on their quality of service delivery in terms of the clinical component and the pharmaceutical care bit? And other than that, the financial mechanisms that were affected by COVID-19 being met. So in that case, what we started was doing a survey on the same and doing that survey on the community pharmacies, the impact, the intervention that are, they're adopting, and what kind of support would be ideal in terms of strengthening pharmaceutical systems, focusing on community pharmacies post COVID-19. And that has been a survey that we did with That's Reculture, Philips Pharmaceuticals Limited, and the Pharmacy and Poisons Board. The findings, the survey is being analyzed. The results should be released either by the end of the week or early next week. So be on the lookout and the survey can guide any other person who wants to intervene in terms of improving the community pharmacy's response to COVID and even cushioning community pharmacies and improving the service delivery so that we have community pharmacies that are offering quality care to the patients who need it. And not only quality services to the patients who need it, but they are resilient and able to meet the healthcare needs of the society. Because if we want to achieve universal healthcare coverage, 
then it doesn't happen from a point of engaging the public sector only. These are other players in the sector. How do we enable them meet the needs of what we want them to do? So I think those are measures that are in place. And it is amazing that we are having this session at a point when the world is celebrating International Youth Day with an, the theme Youth Engagement for Global Action. In youth engagement, we need such platforms where we do the work that we do. And in our professional line of work, it's what sets us first on the stage of doing, making an impact. And if we are on the stage to make that impact, then we need the mentorship and guidance from the senior colleagues and the support from one another to be able to make an impact. Then we need to know what challenges are in our society. Once we identify the challenges, we get the right support, then we are better to make a difference in our local context, drive that action for the common healthcare system, the entire health system, and be in a better society. So thank you so much, and I hope we'll get more mentors in the house, we'll get more pharmacists adopting these measures and championing for quality healthcare services. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. David Odhiambo, for that well present, uh, very good presentation. Uh, uh, we must uh, appreciate the fact that our young pharmacists are really, are really doing a good job out there. And uh, just to say that even as an intern pharmacist, uh, sometimes it is not very easy to experience some of these things that you've mentioned and just to appreciate the fact that you are a very keen pharmacist and you're able to put together information as a part of your own growth and to even share with us in this presentation. I want to ask the participants to send their questions in the Q&A tab that is at the bottom of the screen or at the bottom of the slide there, Q&A and would encourage people to send in their questions early or during the presentations and not wait until the end of the presentations. We are going to address the questions at the end of this second presentation. And I want Dr. Esther to get on to her presentation. Dr. Esther, you can okay. unmute yourself. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so thank you everyone and thank you David so much for your presentation. Um, I have worked with you, I have spoken to you and I think that what you do is amazing and especially your advocacy work. So thank you so much for sharing and now as I start my presentation, I will not introduce myself because I think that uh, Opanga already did that um, and I think how I'm going to address my response to the COVID-19 is pretty much also going to tell you guys a lot more about who I am and what I'm involved in and my experiences during COVID-19. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm being asked to project my voice. Sorry, I hope you guys can hear me, but all I'm saying is, I hope this is better. Uh, all I'm saying is I'm going to just highlight my experiences. Um, I'm going to highlight my experiences as an intern um, in my response to COVID-19. Um, and I hope that you guys will learn one or two things from the presentation. So next slide, please. Yes. So as we all may be aware, the COVID-19 pandemic presented um, unprecedented challenges to the healthcare sector. So first of all, there was an increased demand of healthcare products and technologies, you know, used needed to manage COVID-19. And of course, experiences from other countries around the world, you know, including China and Europe, um, and with the rapid spread of the virus, it was like the healthcare resources would be stretched, you know. And of course, secondly, with the lockdown measures in various countries, then medicine supply was hampered um, and this created like a supply chain crisis, which would not only affect access to medicine for COVID-19 therapies, but, it also go but was also going to affect supply of medicines for other diseases. And, and of course, there was and is still like a wealth of information concerning you know, possible treatment therapies for COVID-19. And there was a need to synthesize this information and, you know, and to critically like appraise the evidences that were being uh, made available for treatment therapies for COVID-19 um, for the benefit of just generating like evidence-based um, effective treatment for, the, for our population. 
and um, there was also like you know need for sensitization and for education for both the healthcare professionals and the general public you know and this still needs to be done on how to manage this virus given it was such an, an a novel virus something that we had never seen before in our country so based on these challenges uh, PSK decided to to respond to this pandemic uh, by creating committees um, and so it set up a few committees and one of the committees that was set up was the case management and infection prevention and control um, committee of which I'm a part of. So my incorporation into this committee happened at a very like it was it was prime time you know um, and it's because when when we start when we when we reported the first corona case in Kenya that must have been sometime in March um, and then after that case then you know we started we had a, we started you know to have more cases and it went to the 20s and to the 50s I I just started to become so bothered about how Kenya was treating this particular you know this particular virus uh, so I had information from you know from Europe from you know from the West but then um, what bothered me was why and how we were treating these patients in Kenya, you know, and what our scientists and what our medical doctors, what our pharmacists were, uh, were doing essentially in our country to create recommendations that were that were key and just relevant for our population. And so I started to talk to you know a few people here and there. I'd I'd text or call um, a few doctors at KNH that I knew at NTRH, you know, and and then i think the universe had me and they incorporated me into this committee and it's been an amazing experience and and so i'm just going to outline to you what we've been doing and what i've been involved in and what as a young pharmacist i have been able to pick up uh, from this committee so we were tasked with three major objectives so the first objective was really or rather the first goal was to create a guidance document um, that focused on the pharmaceutical interventions for COVID-19 patients. And this document was supposed to be relayed to clinicians, um, including young, I mean, including pharmacists to provide data that was evidence-based, you know, just not data that was, you know, that was um, a hearsay or opinions, but something that could be banked on and proven, you know, to work for, for COVID-19. And then using this information that we generated and this document that we created, then we were also tasked with providing sensitization to both the healthcare providers and to the general public. And the reason why this is, is because when outbreaks normally happen, then there's a misuse of drugs, you know, there's a misuse of medication. Um, um, and so it was just important for, it was, it was important for us to now sensitize not only the healthcare providers, but also the general public. And we were not to work in isolation, but we were to work um, to complement and to amplify, to amplify, you know, um, responses from other sectors. So in this case, the private sector, um, other other sectors of health, including the government. So we were not to work in a vacuum, but we were supposed to amplify what the other people, what the other sectors are saying, and what they are talking about. So on the right part of your screen, you're going to see the document that we came up with. So it's, we named it, it's called the Pharmaceutical Care and Therapeutic Management of COVID-19 Patients in Kenya. So it's an official clinical practice, an interim guidance document from PSK. So this was the first edition that was launched last month in July 2020. So the nature of the document is that it's a very fluid document. It's an interim do document. And because the information about COVID-19 keeps changing from time to time, then we expect that this information is going to be changed and it's going to up be updated accordingly as, as the information, you know, as the evidence change from time to time. So I'm going to take you guys through the document, you know, just to, just to see what we did, you know, and what me as a young pharmacist learned and what I contributed to. So the next slide, um, pretty much, shows you the various sections within the within the, the the document itself so first of all we had to uh, we had to talk about the role of the pharmacist in clinical care of covid-19 patients because i believe we indeed have a role in these outbreaks and so what is the role of the pharmacist and then we also outlined the the principles of pharmaceutical care 
you know, uh, pharmaceutical care, um, it should be patient oriented with the patient at the center. So how do we go about our interventions and our recommendations for such outbreak and still put the patient at the center of our intervention? And then we had a section on home-based care for COVID-19, because remember, we are all about giving information to the to the general population about people who are positive but then are are being cared for at home. So how do they like how does this go on? Um, and then um, how do we then manage severe and critical COVID-19 disease? Um, and then we had a section on the COVID-19 trial therapies. And so this one we had to really look into the evidences that are around the world and to critically appraise them and come back come up with a document or rather with recommendations that we could bank on and say that this is what we need to do and then we need we also had considerations for special populations so for example populations you know who are suffering from diabetes populations who are suffering from hypertension you know those who have diabetes mellitus um, you know and so on and so forth what about pregnancy you know how is COVID-19 managed for pregnancy now the importance of this document and why this document is very very important it's because it was cultured and it was designed in a way that suits the pharmacist yeah and just because we are medica medication in uh, medication experts then it's important for us to know the various management interventions and the various drugs that are used um, and how like what to expect you know including the including the adverse effects and the dosages that are being used all over the world and it was interesting because now i had i had a role in in thinking you know when you're coming up with a treatment with a guidance document and or when you're giving recommendations about a particular treatment then whatever you're recommending as a professional really needs to be evidence-based and what i learned um in this in this committee which is what i'm going to talk about in the next slide what i learned is how to how to critically look at evidences and the steps you really need to take before you recommend a product you know for for your friend or for the population so the next slide um, made me aware that there are various types, types of evidences so there's opinions you know which are based on people's beliefs um, but you know, you don't want to base treatment guidelines on people's opinions, you know. I can't come and ask you like, what do you think we can use to treat COVID-19? And I take that and put it in a recommendation document. So we had to look at evidence-based medicine. So usually evidence-based medicine is usually information that's consensual, that's judicious, that's been tried, proven, and tested. And we can, you know, we can rightly say that this is the medication that we think you know, will help our patients. And so we had to ask ourselves um, a few questions and even including like the committee. The committee members were made of amazing people, you know, who amazing pharmacists who are well beyond, you know, my area of expertise. I've not even done a year in the profession, but they were very warm and welcoming and they really helped me understand how we review documents and how we create guidance documents. So various things that you needed to, like before an evidence is, is termed uh, or rather is rolled out to the population you need to determine its quality its validity and how, how applicable and its applicability to your practice so um, we needed to ask ourselves what the source of our document is because a scientific source is more credible than one that is not scientific and then we just needed to really keenly evaluate the evidence and ask ourselves how up to date our evidence is uh, the evidence is, you know, what were the measurable outcomes for those particular studies that we are we are relying on, you know, um, and measurable outcomes. This just means, you know, were the patients discharged? Um, were they, you know, did they, you know, did they have, uh, like, how long did they stay in the hospital? And like, how many of them? Like, what what was the percentage? Was it ninety percent? Was it fifty percent? You know, and what is the impact and application of the results into our practice? Uh, what are the benefits, what are the risks, what are the costs, and what are the potential risks? So all these questions uh, we had to ask ourselves in our committee before deciding what to put down in our document to reveal to the public and to reveal to the clinicians and to reveal all this, you know, to pharmacists. And why I think all this, like, and when we went through all these steps, then we had to remove hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine because of a systematic review and a critical appraisal that 
that said that it really had no benefits and had considerable potential harm, cardiovascular risk. And so just based on how we evaluated our, our, our information, then that had to be, that had to be removed from the recommendation document, just, just based on the guidelines. Um, so whereas I think we did so such important things, I think the major challenge that I found is the lack of just available local clinical trials, you know. Um, it wasn't easy for me to get get information out of that, like it was hardly, scarcely none. You know, we didn't have clinical trials happening at that time, you know, in Kenya, you know, trying to find relevant medicine um, or other therapeutic interventions that are being used for COVID-19 COVID patients. So I think that was my major, major, major trial. Although I will, I will, I will, I would like to thank, I think Coast General Hospital is having a, started a trial a few, a few months ago and also at the Khan University Hospital. So I, I see the efforts that are going on into research and to, and to coming up with interventions, you know, for treatment of such pandemic. And I think going forward, we as young pharmacists really need to be involved in coming up with, you know, coming up with medicines that are cultured for our, our community. So the next part of my response to this pandemic was my work as an FIP intern. So for those of us who are not familiar with FIP, FIP is International Pharmaceutical Federation. So it's a global international, it's a global organization that represents all pharmacists worldwide. And um, in simple terms, it's like a global PSK. So I was, I was assigned to work under the FIPWISE initiative, and FIPWISE here stands for Women in Science and Education. So we launched this in, in 11th, on 11th February this year. And um, the reason why it was launched is because um, after a couple of work report surveys, they came to, or rather it was, it was evident that not very many females, not very many women actually involved themselves in pharmaceutical sciences and education. And so we needed now to focus on why. And according to the report, about approximately only 29% of the worldwide researchers are actually women. And, um, and so our initiative basically now had to ask ourselves like why? Why are women not you know, involving themselves in pharmaceutical research? And why are they not teaching? Why are they not becoming pharmacy educators? And so we discovered that there are various challenges that women actually face in this, in this respect. And such include infrastructure problems, you know, in terms of policies, in terms of um, career progression, um, recruitment, you know, lack of mentors. Uh, very many women lack female mentors that they can look up to, you know, to go into pharmaceutical education and sciences, you know, social norms, some stereotypes, you know, lack of flexible hours for women, uh, leadership positions, you know, discrimination, lack of adequate funding and investment in women's research. And so just looking at all these issues, then this initiative came up um, with the need to empower and to support women in these areas so that they can still excel and be productive in these areas. So our work really majorly focused on advocacy, or rather focuses on advocacy and community engagement. So when COVID-19 happened, now um, we needed to respond to this pandemic. And so my supervisor and I, you know, we sat down and we asked ourselves, so how, how are we going to still support women in pharmaceutical sciences and education, given this new pandemic that's just taking a hold of the entire world? So the first thing, next slide please, the first thing that we needed to appreciate is that whereas COVID-19 is gender blind, it's not gender neutral, you know? Um, COVID-19 affected women and men in very, like in very different ways. And here, since we are dealing with pharmaceutical sciences and education, then women um, who are pharmaceutical scientists, you know, who are researchers and who are now, um, who are now educators, you know, those who now had to go back and work at home and now assume, you know, full-time caregiving roles, you know, so now they're moms, but at the same time, they need to progress and still work on their research and at the same time also teach their students online. So we realized that COVID-19 was going to really bring a stretch 
and, pro and po possibly lower productivity for such women. So we just, our work was to raise awareness on the fact that COVID-19 or rather outbreaks normally come with special, special problems to special people. So, um, and once you raise the awareness, once we raise the awareness, then our work was now to, to give, uh, rather to provide advocacy on the response measures to these problems to take into account the gender, like to take a gender lens to it, you know, so that if you're a pharmacy employer, you know, and you have educators, you have educators who are women, then you may consider giving flexible hours to these women, and maybe longer timelines, you know, um, adjusting, adjusting some timelines, adjusting some timelines, you know, so that, so that it's practical for them, not only to be caregivers and to be mothers at home, but at the same time to be productive 100% in their workplaces. So um, our work as wise was to just advocate that all response measures going forward, you know, for the government and even as us pharmaceutical leaders to take into account all these aspects about outbreaks and how it affects us, you know, in, in general. And also just generation of sex disaggregated data that pretty much tells us um, tells us that this is how women are being affected, this is how men are being affected, and this is how um, this is how um, children are being affected. Because once you have that data, then it's 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 good, or rather, it gives you an informed way of responding to all these needs. And then another thing we uh, we did during this pandemic is we were emphasizing the critical role that pharmacists play during a pandemic, both male and female, you know, and as pharmacy educators, because our focus um, as FIPWISE is on pharmaceutical sciences and education. So as pharmacy educators, like what, what is your role as an educator um, during a pandemic, you know, what's your role even as a student during a pandemic, what's your role in as a researcher during a pandemic. Um, and then what we and I liked our, our last I especially like our li our last uh, response because what we did is we were emphasizing the role of a pharmacist to empower women and caregivers in the community to support the pharmacy response. And I like this because it it, it goes in line with the for the famous quote I think it's the John F Kennedy quote that says ask not what your country can do for you but what you can do for the country. So it's pretty much shift the focus so that as pharmacists, you're asking yourself what you can do to women and caregivers in the community to support them during such pandemic. And the, the, the reality of the matter is that when you're a caregiver at home, and of course, many of the caregivers who take care of chronic patients are normally women. When you're a caregiver and your work is to, is to care for a, a, a patient, who is critically ill, then more often than not, it's very hard to care for the patient 100% and progress, you know, or, or go into a venture, or venture into, into a business um, and just exploit your full potential. So we had to ask ourselves as FIPWISE, how do we tell pharmacists that they really need to empower these caregivers in the community so that everybody is, you know, everybody is happy? So various things that we, we were advocating for is number one, just I haven't like just just go back to the previous slide, please. Various things, various things that we advocated for is number one, like providing PPEs, PPEs uh, like free PPEs for, for these caregivers, or things like ensuring maternal health services continue, ensuring family planning services continue, um, ensuring chronic supply of medicine continue so that all this, um, the caregivers in the community are catered for, you know, or creating economic um, ventures like microfinance groups um, to continue, you know, so that women are empowered and the caregivers are empowered and financial literacy, um, you know, boils down to the community so that they are, like, they don't suffer the adverse effects that normally come with a pandemic. So what exactly did we do as FIPWISE? Um, number one, we had a video series where we were releasing videos of women leaders in pharmaceutical sciences and how they were responding to this pandemic. 
So this video series was just to sort of inspire and encourage other pharmaceutical education educators and other pharmaceutical scientists around the world to realize that they have a role to play in a pandemic. So we also wrote articles and we shared articles all over uh, on the impact of the impact of COVID-19 on pharmaceutical sciences and education. We had a special edition newsletter that focused on, IP, on, on students. And so this was the young pharmacist group within FIP and also the IPSF group of which Kenya, KEPSA is a part of. And so we just highlighted how they are, are adapting to, this, to these tough times. And then we had a webinar on June 17, um, and the photo on your right just shows you the picture of the webinar. Uh, it was on June 17, and our title was COVID-19 Women Front and Center. And I initially, I mean, like essentially all we were trying to do is just to, to showcase the challenges that are being faced by pharmaceutical scientists, researchers, and educators all around the world and how we can you know we can all just come together to make sure that our responses in future you know take all these things into account so that it's just not history repeating itself so that's what we have been doing <clears throat> And I'm very, I'm very fortunate to have been part of that because I think that I learned so much about how to respond to pandemics in the future. That when you're responding to pandemic, global partnerships are very, very important because when you partner with other people and to include other stakeholders, then responding to a pandemic is very, it's a conscious decision. You know, you you have a a wider a wider vision about how this pandemic can affect different people and so you bring minds together and you respond appropriately so the the other way i've been i have responded to this pandemic personally is i have been a source of information like personally yeah i have been a source of information next slide please i've been a source of information not only to family my family but to also my friends and to the general population so focusing on my family, my father always is always sending me videos about uh, about hydroxychloroquine, and we know there was a video about you know um, the video that was that went viral about this 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 doctor who was who was talking about hydroxychloroquine. So I I received that video. I received another video um, about you know about somebody you know people saying that hydroxychloroquine you know is a is a is a good drug and so my father was wondering you know what are you guys doing what are you pharmacists doing about this and i had to explain to him that you know what um, the systematic review that was done the critical appraisal that was done it revealed that hydroxychloroquine doesn't have a lot of effect you know um, doesn't have lack benefit and may have potential harm yeah and but he was very unsettled because because he 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 wants or rather he ideally he would like us as pharmaceutical scientists in Kenya, and as pharmacists and just healthcare professionals in, in Kenya to have recommendations or rather to have clinical, our own clinical trials so that when we're making recommendations, it's not a copy pasting, but then it's something that has been tried, proven and tested in our country. And so I get his point, but I, I appreciate the fact that I was a source of information to them. And um, I, I also demystified myths about COVID-19. And um, I gave advice on wearing masks, especially the cloth fabric masks. You know, I needed to tell my extended family that it needs to be a three ply, you know. So they, yes, they are, they, are, they, are, they are good for, for preventing infection, but then they are even better when they have the three, the three layers of cloth um, so that the fabric mask, you know, gives you maximum protection. So um, last but not least, my last slide, um, I, I, I included this slide here because I think it's important for us to define or rather to ask ourselves what the future of pharmacy is. You know, given this pandemic that has given us an opportunity to learn and to do things different from what we have been doing before. So what is the future of pharmacy? So I think one of the key things that I have learned from my experience is that we need a greater involvement in research and clinical trials. Because I think we owe it to the public to recommend drugs and therapeutic interventions 
that are very, very applicable to them, you know, something that has been tried in the black skin, you know, it would be really, really nice if we, we had a greater involvement in pharmaceutical sciences, in education and in research. Another thing I think um, that is the future of pharmacy is in advocacy and policy making. And I totally love David because he does this on the forefront. You know, we really need to advocate for problems that we think uh, the community needs to know, the health, other healthcare sectors need to know, and what the government needs to know, so that we come up with policies you know, that protect us, that protect our, our pharmacy profession and, you know, and even the public in it by extension. And then I, I think the other future of pharmacy lies in um, an increased awareness in our social responsibility. We as pharmacists, we owe it to the people, you know, to serve them. So that it's not so much of we asking, you know, what, the, what is the government doing for us? You know, how much are they paying us? You know, just, it's not, putting ourselves at the center, but putting the people, our patients at the center. And I think, um, and I was very, very, and, and I think when we increase our social responsibility and our social awareness, then we even become more relevant, you know? You remember the student pharmacist, you know, who came up with the, with the oxygen, what was it? Yeah, who came up with, 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 um, the oxygen tank, I think, yeah, at, at KU. And that was just like a remarkable um, innovation um, for, for us. And I think those are some of the things that we really need to think about. We need to look at the problems that our society is facing and consciously, you know, try to act on those problems. And I think that's the only way we'll benefit the community. Ventilator, yes, so the ventilator. And that's the only way we are going to benefit the community out there. Um, and that's the only way we are going to remain relevant, and that's the only way that we are going to serve, um, the, you know, serve the population. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention, and um, I'd like to thank the enab my enablers, everybody who plays a who has played a role um, in my life in getting me to be part of this initiative. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, PSK members. There, um, PSK and. Um, the, CM, the case management infection prevention control committee. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Esther Nyango, for that very inspiring presentation. A lot of people are loving both of you. There is uh, David Karenye who says uh, he thanks us for the super mentorship of the new professional interns keep the fire burning. And uh, Pamela Anyang also says, thanks Esther for a good presentation. We will go straight to the question and answer uh, section. And uh, there's a question here to Dr. Esther from Dr. Yaile Anthony, who says, um, from the FIP WISE study, specifically in Kenya, what was the main problem for women in pharmaceutical sciences and education? Or in another way, are there concerns about women in pharmaceutical sciences and education in Kenya that you would be aware of? Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yaile, for your question. So uh, the report that was done pretty much focused on the worldwide problems that women face in pharmaceutical sciences and education. And of course, I will extrapolate all this to Kenya. So I think the major, the main problem that women um, in pharmaceutical sciences and education face are number one, there is an issue of discrimination. Um, there's an issue of discrimination. Um, there are barriers towards career progression, yeah? So it's just, it's really hard for women for some reason to advance themselves um, within the career. And then there's also just a uh, lack of, lack of, um, what do you call it, lack of mentors. Yeah. So, and I, this one, I want to touch on young women who are trying to venture into pharmaceutical sciences and education. There, is, there aren't enough mentors up there to, to motivate these young female 
um, students to progress in pharmaceutical sciences and education. And so um, if I were to answer your question, then I think I'd just tell you that there are, the barriers majorly are to do with discrimination um, against women, um, you know, in pharmaceutical sciences and education, um, a lack of, you know, car career progression, um, and then just the fact that that women, for some reason, just you know, face a lot of barriers, um, you know, even towards like being part of the leadership position, you know, leadership teams. Even if you look at the pharmacy schools, you know, in the and the pharmacy schools and the and the management committees you know, in your various uh, places of work, then you realize that majority of them, majority of them are male dominated. And so just asking your question, why, you know, uh, the women, why are they not motivated to, to run for these positions? You know, is there, is it a lack of motivation or are they actually motivated, but there is a barrier that is preventing them from actually looking um, or rather, actually just, you know, getting those positions. So I think it could be both ways. And that's why as people, we, ad we address both sides. You know, we try to inspire and motivate the young people to actually run for these positions. And, as, and then to, to address the barriers, we try to tell them that, you know what, um, women can still actually lead, they can still do research. And so they really need to be given the opportunity, they need to be given the platform, because when that happens, and you need to enable them, you know, considering their other roles as mothers and as caregivers and all these other things that, um, that you know, affect women that don't affect men. So I think, I, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I hope that uh, I've answered that satisfactorily. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Esther, that was a very inspiring answer. We, uh, you know, you, you, you encourage a lot of people, not just uh, women, but young pharmacists and young people out there. We must uh, acknowledge the fact that there are different cadres in this webinar. So even if they're pharmaceutical technologists or nurses or nutritionists and so on, or medical doctors, some probably who are thinking about uh, getting a pharmacy degree and becoming pharmacists. This is a very good point to really get uh, this kind of information from people like yourselves. Um, Dr. Munua Gashuhi says, and this is, I think uh, Dr. David would respond to this. Now that early symptoms of COVID-19 are flu-like, and non-specific, and the community pharmacy being the first point of call for a critical mass of our health-seeking population. Should the pharmacies be donning full PPE at the pharmacy counter? David, you can unmute yourself and Thank respond you so to that. Dr. Maik and Dr. Munio for the question. Well, community pharmacies are the first point of call for critical mass of health-seeking population. But when you look at it, the most critical thing that we need to ask ourselves and respond to is, we are pharmacists, we are professionals, we understand the mechanisms of transmission of COVID-19, majorly respiratory droplets and the fluids that are transmitted. So in this kind of a situation, when you talk about full PPE, you would be talking about from gum boots, the whole overall covers and coats, what risk of transmission exists? For example, if you're in a community pharmacy, the distance between you and the person buying your products, it's majorly the respiratory droplet that might get to you. So you have to look at the extent of that risk in your setting. For example, I remember when we were part of the Green Cross accreditation program, as a community pharmacy, you need to have the consulting station where you get to interact with the patients. If the contact is a little closer, then you need more of the PPEs. If you are dealing with them from over the counter with more distance in between, you, need the, you, you can need the face shield, and the masks in place. But beyond that, it won't serve a purpose as much. And this reminds me to a post that I saw yesterday of one of our senior pharmacists in the practice and a friend and a former lecturer, Dr. Kiari. He's talking about the issue that we have, especially in the burial and all that. The risk of transmission of COVID-19 is respiratory droplets and it's not any contact with anybody fluid as much. And that is something that need to guide even intervention that people are putting in terms of the burial and all. So in community pharmacies, yes, the risk of exposure does exist, 
but we have to be objective in terms of where does the risk come and come and how exposed are you and what kind of measures do you need to put you won't for example wear a gum boot when you're going let's say to wash your house because you have a risk of infection like the protection measure should be matched with the risk of exposure and that is what i think in terms of our communication we need to contextualize it to what we really the risk that we face and then let the risk that is faced be aligned to the mitigation measure thank you uh, thank you so much uh, dr david odiambo for that answer i think it's so important that education is properly carved especially during this pandemic, because there's quite a lot of information and we can't entirely blame uh, even the Ministry of Health or other bodies that are responding to this pandemic. I think we are all cautious about a virus whose knowledge is still skeptical. We are still trying to fully understand how this thing behaves. Of course, the most updated information is that the virus would be transmitted through aerosols in the sense that if you're coughing or laughing or doing whatever it is to remove uh, a bit of mucus, and a bit of whatever else that comes out from the respiratory system out, that would be the channel which would transmit this virus. Uh, hopefully, once we get more and more information, some of the scenes that we see on TV, especially burials or other functions, would be improved. Dr. Hilary Kagwa uh, appreciates both of you and says that, uh, you know, he's very proud for your dedication in this noble profession. I want to ask a question to Dr. David Odiambo again. You talked about rye culture being a social enterprise. You could briefly, because I'm sure there are people out here who are very, very curious about uh, what that means, you could maybe just briefly say what are social enterprises and how beneficial can they be? Dr. David. Thank you so much for that. So, the culture being a social enterprise, it is a business, but it's the business component is because it has to make money and sustain itself. But at the end of the day, the main focus is ensuring that it serves a social purpose, it solves a social problem. So what are the challenges that we're having? So in client or background in healthcare as a pharmacist especially, we look at it in terms of we have a technical knowledge and capacity to address some of the health issues that we have. So when we're solving these problems, it will be a business model, but we have to ensure that we ad address issues on health access, championing for them in advocacy and all. So in our social enterprising, it's majorly, it's a business focusing on the social impact and metrics that guide in terms of evaluating whether we are performing or not is the impact of the work that we do. So for example, majorly of our work has been on health advocacy, health communication, and now capacity building, because we realize that some of us, for example, personally I was exposed because of the, my leadership in KEFSA, the Pharmacy Students Association of Kenya, that made me know the scope of what pharmacy has to offer. What happens to over 1,800 pharmacy students who are in the seven universities in the country? If they can't get access to the same information, then it means with no direct employment for pharmacists, they might never get access, they might never be exposed. So if I have the ability to bring that platform to them and enable them get the information they need, then that is an impact. Because with 1,800 pharmacy students who are exposed and able to deliver an impact, every community where they are, they help those people solve their health problems. They can communicate with them the way Esther was talking about, source of information. They make that impact that's guided with solid, critical, and reliable information. That's a move. And now the question would be, how do we make it then profitable in terms of ensuring we can access that information? How many organizations are working to ensure people have access, but they don't have the medium to link the consumer and the source of that information? If you can break the gap, then the person who wants that information to get the final recipient gets your platform and the ultimate community benefits because you are giving the impact they need. And that is the whole model of how we look at the whole chain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, George Mugi says congratulations to both of you. Um, you represent the future pharmacy profession and I can vouch for that. So his only concern is the apathy in young pharmacists working in the pharmaceutical manufacturing industries. 
particularly in quality control and manufacturing. So what factors could be contributing to this? As we think about the factors, we could also think about solutions or how do we encourage more pharmacies to get into manufacturing? Dr. Esther, maybe you could uh, respond to that. Yes, I could. Uh, so uh, the apathy in young pharmacists working in pharma, manufacturing industries, I think is very, very true and it's a very correct observation. Uh, the reason why I think this is the the, I, the reason why I think this is the case is because number one, the nature of the pharmaceutical industry currently in Kenya is not I, I, I don't know how to say it, is not is not is not something that we, that the young pharmacists are attracted to. Yeah. Um, if you compare like other countries that are much developed, you know that have a very, very, very bright, vibrant pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing industries, and they have elaborate research. I don't think we as a country are there yet. You know, we are largely processing, you know, like we are, we are largely um, a processing country. And so we don't have a lot of um, manufacturing um, ability, you know, as a country. And I just, so I think I would blame the nature of our market currently. And also, I'd also like to say that there's a problem with, with um, pharmacists, the young pharmacists. They, they need to be sensitized on the importance of research and just development of new manufacturing molecules. So I think it's both ways. I think there is a lack of sensitization such that we are not motivated in school as young pharmacists on the importance of PC and manufacturing, but also at the same time, when you go to practice, when you go out there to a manufacturing company, the only place you can pretty much work as a pharmacist is when you're like the company pharmacist or with your head of PC. The positions are very limited. There are not so many. Um, and so I think maybe going forward, of course, having manufacture, like having a vibrant manufacturing, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, capacity needs funding, it needs support, you know, from various sectors, you know, from like the government, the government would need to come in um, and support research in pharmaceutical intervention, you know, other organizations would need to come in and support us. And so I think the society needs to be sensitized to be told that we need to we need to invest in production of our own medicine. You know, what happened in, if there's a total lockdown, then we can't get medicine because we largely import medicine. So if we can develop things for ourselves and if the government and other relevant stakeholders can be, um, can be, um, can be made aware that they need to invest in this so that we have a growing platform, uh, we have a growing uh, manufacturing and, and industrial platform, then I think more pharmacists will be motivated because now they will, they will see a need and a place for them um, you know, to, to implement their, their, their pharmaceutical knowledge and what they have learned in school. So I think the problem is both ways. The problem is in our industry currently, and the problem is also the education aspect and um, the awareness um, um, for the young pharmacists, um, they really don't see the importance because also the industry doesn't, is not attractive, it's not creative, it's not something, you know, it's not vibrant, you know, yet. So um, I, I hope my answer, I answer, I have answered your question accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Esther, for that. Uh, you know, that is part of the big four agenda. Manufacturing is a focus. We just need, as you say, to tailor it so that we can have more and more people coming out of the university and going straight into manufacturing, uh, whether it is as a job, as a position, or they could actually be included as part of you know, the adverts or requirements for recruiting people in manufacturing industries and say that if you actually did an internship in a certain industry and they're recruiting, as part of uh, trying to attract people, they shouldn't put their five years experience in manufacturing. They should say, if you did your internship in this industry, then 
you actually increase your chances of getting recruited here. I think that would go a, a long way. Dr. David, can you just, do you want to add maybe, I'll give you one minute just to add on to that. One minute. Actually, the way Esther has made it is clear. And the other okay. challenge that we have with the pharma industry is that exposure is not as much because we get the interest when you have the experiential learning and you're part of the industry and doing the actual work that it entails. Look at it when you talk about, talk to the different pharmacies, the young pharmacies who are either doing the electives or their internship in the industries. Most of the QC work and even the regulatory issues and all, they're not involved in it. So you end up staying within the yards and all. So you don't see the impact of what you are doing during the experiential learning, and this makes you not want to get back to it. So that is also a gap that needs to be bridged in terms of training and the experiential learning. Thank you. Okay, back still on you, David. Uh, we are still on this right culture. Uh, I, I had a question here. How, is, is, is right culture open to everyone? How could the people, for example, participating in this webinar, directly benefit from dry culture? Well, in directly benefiting from dry culture, everybody has a different interest. So in such kind of a situation, it would be keen to know what is your angle of, what are you looking at getting engaged in dry culture and what value do you feel like you need to derive from it? If that's the case, then we can see how to align to see how we contribute to each other's agenda at the same time. Give us an example. You know what pharmacists or people in the pharmacy workforce want. For example, if it is a community pharmacy, they probably want more sales. If it is somebody working in a hospital, they will probably want uh, to get more involved in research or get more information about certain things in a clinical, a clinical setting. How would dry culture contribute towards achieving this? Yeah. So in, in terms of culture, for example, if you're dealing with community pharmacies, as you mentioned, the first one, we're doing this survey. This survey is supposed to guide in terms of as a community pharmacy, you need more sales, but that sales is aligned to the quality of services and the services that you offer. So if you can talk about it in terms of what, how do you diversify your services, then that is the value that we offer to you through the pharmaceutical system strengthening in the community pharmacy outlet. So you have community-based clinical pharmacy services where you can offer the consulting services, medicines reconciliation, health promotion and health education, and you can have a referral system where you manage your clients from the community pharmacy. With more services and more quality integrated into the service scope, then you have a chance of making more sales and even having repeat clients. That means you have a market base that are already in place. In the hospital setting, one, most of our research is in terms of you have the medical information, the data that's guiding you in terms of delivering quality services in the hospital where you work. But at the end of the day, this data has to be contextualized to the patients that you're serving. And beyond that, it has to be complying with the different policy issues. If our policies are not aligned to the clinical data that's coming from hospitals, then it's not making any difference. And this is something that even as well in terms of the advocacy work that we do, you have to relate the research and the clinical practice bit to the actual policy and the guidelines that are guiding what interventions are there. I remember having a discussion with one of my preceptors at KNH. We have about bio biologists and biotherapeutics. We are talking about biosimilars which would be cheaper and would give the same therapeutic benefits to the patient. But then most of them are not available in the country. Reason being the policy, the regulatory frameworks to ensure they get into the country as much and not guided by the clinical data behind their use. What if we could integrate the two so that we have the clinical research on it, the policy and the guidelines from the business bit, and we bring the gap. So these are kind of discussions that we need to bring in the advocacy space to link different aspects. The clinical practice is growing, and when the clinical practice is growing, it's guiding policy. That policy ensures patients get the quality care they need. And that is the kind of diversity that we're bringing through the culture now. Thank you, David. Uh, uh, I, I'm really enjoying this session with both of you. And, uh, you know, I, I, I actually feel that uh, we're having discussions with consultants here. And uh, this, this is really encouraging. Uh, Linda Masiga says in the community pharmacy, blood pressure and blood sugar tests and the risk of droplets from clients, you know, is something that we need to be worried about. 
Dr. Esther, is it advisable to continue testing clients in pharmacies? An opinion again, yeah. <laughs> That's going to be me, my opinion. Is it advisable to continue testing um, uh, patients in pharmacies? Well, huh. Can I pass this to David? <laughs> David, uh, you will tackle that one. But meanwhile, Esther, I'm not letting you lose one. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. Could you contribute to this? I have a question here. Yeah. Um, what do you think could be improved in patient education as regards COVID-19? We know what is already there. What do you think could be improved? Um, what do I think um, could be improved in, in the... Uh, another way of just saying is that, do you think whatever the Ministry of Health is telling us or whoever is uh, telling people out there sufficient or is there something else that could be improved, maybe revised or added? What else okay. is missing in this education about COVID-19? Okay. Um, the only thing I know that I think could be improved is how to culture the messages that are coming from MOH for different people, yeah? So um, we know COVID-19 and we know social distancing, you know, is happening. But then what happens to, like, what do you do if you need to go back to work? Because right now, the lockdown and the restrictions are being, are being loosened, yeah? So, like, what do you do in an organization where if you need to go back to work, you know, what measures can you still take and still um, social distance? You know, for children, how do you, how do you um, give them information about COVID-19 in a way that is palatable to them, yeah? So I think what needs to be improved is to look at, okay, fine, there's this, everybody knows about COVID-19, but then how do we constantly change our information, you know, and look at all groups, you know, for those people who are disabled, you know, for people who, who like, let's say for mothers who are still breastfeeding, you know, for just so that everybody can relate to this information at a very personal level, yeah? Because I think yeah. every single time when you're just telling us that, you know, we need to do one, two, three things, you know, but people are still, people are now going back to work. But how do we do that carefully and still give them information about going back to work, you know, but still uphold the basic principles of COVID-19, you know, pandemic? Yeah. I think that can be improved. I think, I think you're very right. I think uh, we need to make the new normal uh, normal, you know, because uh, we were being told that this is the new normal but uh, there's a sense of abnormality in the new normal. So the new normal need to feel normal so that people don't uh, really focus on how dangerous or how bad things are. Uh, because psychology sometimes says, you know, if you keep focusing on the bad, then uh, the, the bad, you know, takes a larger proportion of, you know, your thinking and you become, uh, yeah, that, that can really affect you negatively. David, uh, community pharmacies and the usual tests? So on the issue of testing, it depends yes. on the circumstances where we are talking about it. In the current space where we're talking about the risk of exposure and everything, we have when we have the right PPEs and protective measures in place, it's ideal to do that because you will have to weigh in terms of what are the value of the tests that you're performing. You have blood pressure testing, the blood sugar, is to ensure that you're monitoring the vitals of these individuals to ensure they derive maximum benefit from your care that you're offering them. So is it, is it right to let go of the test? It means that either way, they'll still seek them from another place. So why not give them the services that they need because they're already at your place by taking, put into place extra precautionary measures. That's the deal for me. And other than that, letting go of a service that you've been offering it's not the best way to offer care because you are letting go of that care. You are absconding your responsibility to offer the care to someone who saw the need to have it in you. So Thank in you, the David. context of COVID-19, extra measures and that's good enough. Thank you, David. And thank you, Dr. Esther. 
two consultants who came today to our webinar. We really appreciate the time that you took to uh, really come up with uh, these two presentations and appreciate the work that you have done. I want to appreciate the over 300 people, participants who showed up this morning to share with us, uh, everybody in the pharmacy workforce, as well as uh, those from other cadres. And uh, I also want to appreciate my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Silvio Panga, and uh, the CEO, Dr. Daniela Bonene, uh, for the consistency uh, that we've had through these webinars. Uh, thank you again, and I want to hand over this back to Dr. Daniela to close. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it was such a, such a lovely uh, session, very educative. Uh, we seniors were inspired and learned something from our juniors. And uh, I would really want to congratulate you, David and Esther, for uh, being you know, keen to participate in issues of the profession at the local level, at an international level. You're truly an inspiration. And if we could have more young pharmacists like you, then the sky is the limit uh, for PSK. Uh, thank you for, <clears throat> uh, to my moderators as well for always being available for this uh, webinar series. And thank you to the participants who uh, take time out of uh, mid-morning, mid-week um, to just uh, listen uh, to different experiences on COVID-19 response. Uh, so from me, uh, it's a good day to you and let's meet next Wednesday at the same time. We shall have a team uh, from the UK uh, on our dialogues next Wednesday. Thank you, have a good day. <laughs>